Hey, I'm uh, Travis back again. Uh, got my coffee. See? Got my dog. She's not impressed. <clears throat> I recently uh, watched a video that's kind of blown up. I guess it's, I guess it's blown up on YouTube. I'm not sure. With Ricky Gervais and Stephen Colbert, the great Christian apologist. Um, and they were debating uh, the existence of God. And for those of you who've actually, for those of you which one day might be four, three, one to four people, um, for, for those of you out there who may ever watch this, um, that take the study of these things seriously you would have thought, why did this video blow up? There's, This is internet talking points Ricky Gervais is presenting as an arguments against the existence of God. That anybody could, even an atheist, you know, when I say even an atheist, not that atheists don't have the capacity, but it is, he was representing that worldview. And an intelligent atheist can stop and sit there and think about these things and be like, is that actually a good argument? And I wanted to present one that I actually thought rhetorically was really good, but not a good argument in the end of the day. All you do is stop and think about it. But the, but I like the way it's worded rhetorically. He said, um, if you took all of the books in the world and destroyed them, eventually a science text could come back around. But the religious books would be gone forever. Now, this was not a particularly good argument for atheism. Uh, it was more of an argument for scientism. Uh, and the idea here was that um, everything that, uh, you know, that science would make, make itself obviously known, but these religious texts, um, you know, wouldn't. Now, I think that's quite fascinating. Um, and it shows a misunderstanding of of the of the history of science if you look at blackwell companions on on the history of science you're going to find that it has a rich christian tradition it has a rich uh islam tradition as well until a certain period of time where it gets kind of shut down but um there are certain elements that have to be in place and assumed prior to doing any kind of science now, what is that? Well, I'm going to get to that in a minute. I want to read to you this passage out of Deuteronomy. Um, and I just feel like this is kind of the thing that um, uh, I, that I, that's on my mind as I look at this. This is Deuteronomy 1, um, verse 16. It says, And as I charged your judges at that time, hear the case between your brothers, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the alien who is with him. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone. For the judgment is God's. And the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things that you should do. Now, Where, what, when, when we got rid of all religious texts and the science reasserted itself in this little scenario, where in science are you going to find that sentiment? You're not. Science can't tell you to judge righteously. Science can't tell you that you ought to be objective. Um... Try to think of a scientific method that will arrive at the necessity of being objective. Try using science to figure out that there are other minds other than your own. It's such a, it's, it sounds like a good argument against religion until you stop and break it down. And the point here is, is not to defend all of religion or anything like that, but you have to remember, and I'm not going to go into deep detail about this, maybe one day, but Ethics is a prescriptive enterprise. And what I mean by that is you can't, ethics is always about when one, what one ought to do. And you can't go to science to tell someone what they ought to do morally. 
And that would include the scientific method. Should you be honest when approaching the scientific method? Well, there's no science to tell you to do that. So I think Ricky Gervais's argument, which is really an internet argument, uh, falls very, very flat to the history of, of what has created ultimate the ultimate view of the universe, which is that I have certain obligations beyond myself to things that are objective and true. That does not arrive by science alone. I had a friend of mine that this was a long time ago. We were debating, you know, voting for president and all that. I said, at the end of the day, no matter how good of a president you get, they won't teach you that your child ought not cheat on the test in school. And he really wanted to dissect that and talk about it. We had a really interesting conversation about it because there's a lot of things we get focused on and don't realize the underpinnings that are more important. And so this would be a good case of that. Well, I'm running out of time here. I don't want to make the video run too long. But I wanted to say in this passage that uh, God gives us a format by which we ought to by which we ought to see morality, which is that we should try to be objective. And a, certainly in a judicial sense. Now, this was written to a theocracy, and I understand that, and I'm not trying to ignore that. But my whole point here is that you would have a lot of people that tell you that objectivity does not exist in the Bible. Well, guess what? It doesn't necessarily exist in science either. Objectivity is a very broad concept. And unless you have a worldview that even allows for it, you can forget any other endeavors you claim are objective because you will be ultimately undermining them. All right, talk to you next time.